All right, uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening as appropriate based on your time zone and welcome to this online launch event of the new crisis group report relaunching the Kosovo-Serbia dialogue, which was published a bit earlier this week. Um, crisis group, International Crisis Group is an independent organization dedicated to saving lives through the prevention the mitigation and the resolution of deadly conflict. And I am the director of the Europe and Central Asia program at Crisis Group, which um, is the program in which the research um, that led up to this report was, uh, was carried out. So really thrilled to have a terrific panel to discuss both what uh, we found and wrote up and what it means. Um, so just to briefly introduce the speakers, um, Marco Prelitz uh, is our consulting Balkans analyst and he is the primary author of the report. Uh, joining him are Ivan Krastev, uh, chairman of the Center for Liberal Strategies and a crisis group trustee, also somebody with a wealth of experience with the region. And Valerie Hopkins, who is the Southeast Europe correspondent for the Financial Times, and who has lived and worked extensively uh, in the Balkans. So before we get started, uh, just a little bit about how we're gonna do this. Um, this is gonna be a conversation. Uh, it's not gonna be a bunch of speeches. Uh, the folks you've got in front of you who know so much are going to talk to each other and you're gonna learn from listening to them. Um, I'm then gonna open it up to the audience for your questions and answers. So the way we're gonna do that is there's a Zoom Q&A box um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen at this point. Um, I'm pretty sure you've probably experienced it before. So type your questions there. Please do um, begin your question or end it with your name and affiliation. Uh, we are only going to take questions that have a name and affiliation. So anonymity will um, get your question sadly ignored. So just so you know that. Um, also, please be aware that this conversation is being recorded, live streamed on Facebook, and will be shared on the Crisis Group website uh, after the event ends. So that kind of takes us through the preliminaries, and I now want to um, start a discussion. Um, and what I want to start with, since this is a launch, is for us to ask Marco. Um, Marco, if you were to, you know, if you were given almost no time at all, two minutes, right? You've got a senior official from somewhere in front of you, and you're trying to say why we put out this report, why does we decided it was important to put this out, and what the bottom lines are. How would you how would you describe it? Hey, thanks, thanks, Oya. Um, it's almost impossible to reduce anything in the Balkans to two minutes, but I'll try. So um, we start with the observation that the dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia is dead in the water. The parties send their representatives to Brussels, they talk, they go home, nothing, nothing changes. We look at what has to happen to get the dialogue moving toward its conclusion. And we also, in the other half of the report, and it really has these two aspects that are very distinct. We look at the likelihood that it will not get moving anytime soon. And we look at a number of things that need to be done while we live with the status quo of a dialogue that is somewhat moribund. So in that first half, let me mention three things. We look at the need for clarity about the goal of the dialogue, which has to be a positive bilateral relationship between the two states built on mutual recognition and going beyond that to at least the absence of hostility. Second, we look at the need to have a coherent negotiating position in Pristina. Complicated issue, there's a government crisis there now, but more than that, the, uh, the Kosovo uh, representatives have yet to arrive at a, a strategy about how they want to, to address the dialogue. And finally, uh, the need to, to bring the people in to be more transparent about what is actually going on. And on the other side, for a variety of reasons, we think this, is, this needs to happen, but it's not gonna happen in the next 
I don't want to give a time frame, but the near future. We need to do things to improve Kosovo's situation because it's the main victim from the impasse, the, the, the side that suffers the most. So we look at possibility of integrating Kosovo into a number of other international organizations like the Council of Europe. Uh, we look at the option to uh, improve its bilateral relations with friendly countries and multilateral relations with sets of friendly countries. And finally, we, we, uh, we, we allude to uh, increasing the, um, the pressure on, on Serbia, which at times seems to indicate that it can just live with this for as long as it, it, uh, it wants to. Um, we think that's not entirely the case. So that's, that? that, that's a great overview. Um, I wanna ask Valerie what she thinks of it uh, and uh, what she thinks of kind of um, the notion that this is the right time to try to, um, on the one hand, accept reality, on the other hand, try to improve it at least a little bit, even if you can't fix it. Um, well, thank you so much. It's, uh, it's a bit odd for me. I, I think I normally wouldn't have accepted an invitation where I'm answering questions instead of asking them. Uh, but since this is uh, one of my favorite topics um, and has been for many years, I guess I couldn't resist. And it's nice to see so many familiar names um, here uh, from the time that I ate, slept, and bred breathed only because it was a real dialogue um, and unfortunately I think um, it's true to say that in those uh, since those years you, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of action but not a lot of, of progress um, what do I think um, I think I do think I agree that it's always a good time and I think this report is ha, ha, Marco has really kind of carefully uh, distilled the current situation and how we got here and also outlined the mostly less than 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 a thrilling options for for both sides and for the international powers who have the wherewithal to to try and take them on. Um, and I think it's a very good and important time with the change in administration in the US and the you know prospect uh, looming of a new administration in Germany as well. Um, uh, so I think it's it's really time, you know, as the transatlantic alliance is being recalibrated uh, for, for both sides to sort of recommit and decide what they're going to do. Um, I think we'll have more time maybe to get into to some of the, the policy options that were outlined in terms of sticking with the status quo. Um, uh, or, or trying to move towards some kind of border changes, which I'm more hesitant about than 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 many others, um, but uh, but I think this provides a great ground for 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 a discussion, and I I think I think it's important to note, you know, Marco, you in the in the report you mentioned one of Albin Corti's um, comments that that they're just going to be mo more patient than anyone else, like Milorad Dodik, um, and I think that. Uh, I think it's very hard to continue to expect that level of patience because while the dialogue, while many Kosovars, I think, no longer see the dialogue as a top political issue, it doesn't really figure into election campaigns, it has been the reason why many, many of the governments uh, have fallen in recent years and, and something that continues to stymie the political progress of the country. Um, so I do think that without really tackling this head on, it's going to be very hard to, to keep moving forward. So I'll stop there. That was longer than one minute. Sorry about that. No, thank you, Valerie. I think you raised uh, some important questions. So, and I think it's a good way to bring in uh, Yvonne and ask whether he thinks that the report is kind of right with the fairly limited, not a lot can be done now, improve things at the margins, or if there's more that one could do. And in that case, who's won and what should they be doing? Oh, thank you very much. And of course, first of all, it's a heroic thing these days to have a report which is not uh, connected to COVID. Uh, so from this point of view, already a kind of a breaking <laughs> status quo. Uh, but I do believe it is quite important because at least for me, the report uh, is very valuable to the extent that both in 2019 and 2020, first Europeans, then the Americans were signaling that we are very close to a breakthrough moment. So if you are seeing what was happening, there was a lot of dating between Serbia and Kosovo, but not a prospect for marriage, obviously. Uh, and from this point of view, the question is, are we really close to breakthrough? What is going to come out of these efforts, first by Mogherini and then uh, uh, by the Trump administration? And I agree with Marco. I don't believe that uh, 
in this environment, by the way, very much dominated by uh, COVID, but also by domestic political uh, uh, crisis and particularly the election situation in Kosovo, to expect that till the end of this year, you are going to have a kind of an answer to the Kosovo-Serbia uh, uh, relations. In my view, it's unrealistic. And when you go with something that is unrealistic, it can backfire. So managing expectations, in my view, this is fair and this is very important, good enough. Uh, secondly, and uh, here also, I very much agree with Marquis, what if they're going to be a success, what we're going to call success? Because part of the problem with these negotiations is that anytime people decided to talk, we claim that it was a success. Uh, but in the case of Serbia, Kosovo, they're talking for 20 years and they can talk for 200 years. And then basically, I do believe that just calling this success is not enough. So from this point of view, mutual recognition is really what we should be looking for. And from this point of view, if you're not going to have a mutual recognition, you can have steps, you can have situation better or worse, uh, but this should be the, the solution in a way basically both Serbia and Kosovo are going to define what they want. And certainly on this, probably I, uh, I, I'm much kind of a, a relaxed than others. Personally, I'm ready to live with anything that the Serbian and the Kosovo societies are going to agree, but there should be consensus on both sides. It's not one person agreeing with another person on a high positions. So from this point of view, I'm not going to say no to anything which is legally valid, but they should be based on consensus on the level of society and not simply basically on a pressure coming from outside that is pushing one government or another government to accept something that is going to be contested at home. And from this point of view, uh, where I also do believe that Mark is right is that while there is no any prospect for breakthrough in the coming months, it's really important to continue and pressing and discussing. Because this is one of those issues that are going to become a classical sleeper. You're so much used to nothing to happen that any time you're doing it is just for tactical reasons. Uh, and we should not do it because at the end of the day, both Serbia and Kosovo, and honestly speaking, Kosovo more than Serbia, uh, are damaged by this. Uh, and here I'm going to end up in a diplomacy. They like to talk about constructive ambiguity, but there is also destructive ambiguity. And unfortunately, I do believe that the Serbia Kosovo relations very much fit the idea of a destructive ambiguity at the moment. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ivan. Um, so, you know, as you were speaking, I was thinking that the uh, dating metaphor is interesting because it's less dating with a view to marriage. It's more um, negotiations through a long separation with a view to a mutually acceptable divorce settlement, right? Which is very, very, very long in the works. So Marco, tell us what the custody battle is here and uh, how, you see, um, how you see the two separated parties making progress towards resolving it. I think it, it operates on two almost totally separate levels. I mean, there's the debate about what is really going to happen, which is not a debate about a lot of, there's not a lot of disagreement. There's some disagreement that it's real and actually quite bitter, but um, not, you know, not, not that much. And then there's a debate which is somewhat theatrical and for public consumption. Um, so, you know, when Serbian political actors say, we're not going to recognize Kosovo for, you know, in my lifetime, for 100 years, for 500 years, whatever, um, that does not mean that they really believe that at some point in the foreseeable future, Kosovo will really be reintegrated, right? Um, and with a bit less confidence, I can say that when Kosovar politicians say, you know, either we're, we're not willing to make any compromises at all, and we're simply going to wait for Serbia to apologize, pay reparations, and then we'll shake their hand, um, that they really mean that literally. 
Um, but that is still destructive, okay? It's still destructive because people listen to that, they hear that, and they, they draw certain conclusions uh, from it, and they are not ready, therefore, to see their governments uh, acting in a way that leads them toward any kind of meaningful compromise. So the custody di dispute, which is the real dispute, is pretty small, um, and it relates to basically uh, how the, the, the minorities, the ethnic minorities in, in both countries are, are governed, what, what happens with them. Um, you know, there's, a, there's an Albanian minority in Serbia, they need to be addressed just for fairness, but the real issue is uh, the Serbian minority in, in Kosovo. Uh, which lives in a couple of different places in, in a few distinct situations. There are some that are very compact next to Serbia, others who are more scattered and, and more isolated. So what is gonna happen with them? Uh, how, is, how are those parts of Kosovo gonna be governed? Are they even gonna stay in Kosovo? Uh, that gets into the whole question of where the border lies. Um, but these are, you know, we're talking about small parts of the country populated by relatively few people. And about all the rest, there's very close to agreement, mm -hmm. which cannot be admitted. That's my view. So that, and because we can't admit it, we have this theatrical kind of presentation where we sing arias about, um, you know, territorial integrity and our history and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Valerie, do you agree with that, that it's um, a lot of posturing uh, and everyone knows what it needs, what, you know, where it really needs to come out, but nobody's able to go there? Um, I mean, I think there's always certainly uh, quite a lot of posturing. I think that, uh, and I think that you can see very clearly that, that when uh, there's either a domestic pressure or when you get close to an agreement, it's like one of these, I don't know, um, uh, what are they called? Toxic relationships or something, right? You know, where there's a mismatch between, uh, between, but just, since we're doing all these dating analogies, between um, the pursuer and the pursued. And, and I think um, it's, it's definitely clear that, that in times where things are going well, going forward, getting implemented, there can be a dramatic incident that comes in and um, explodes the relations for or or, or and, and and puts the brakes on on negotiations for a while gives everybody you know buy some time they need to cool off and you know like the train and that came in 2017 you know, from russia which everybody could have seen um you know for for two weeks as as a as a looming catastrophe um but the, the other point that I wanted to make actually to your first question about why this is an, which is an interesting and good time to have this report is that we could be looking at by the middle of the year, a total, like totally new uh, teams on both sides doing negotiations. You know, if it, if, uh, if it Vendosia does win the elections as it looks that it will, um, after being forced out of power in a pandemic um, by, by a Western government, uh, my own home country's government, uh, in, in the hopes of, of having a deal, um, uh, that, you know, they may take a very different approach and may, if the polling is to be believed, actually have a considerable amount of the population behind them, which is something that, that successive governments in Kosovo have not had any, any popular legitimacy. And in Serbia as well, they're, they're, you know, there'll be the same people at the top and, and much more continuity um, from the Serbian negotiating side than there has been from the Kosovo side, but there will still be a new team, new faces, new personalities. And, but, but we, which is which I think is is a new chance to build relationships. I mean, when I would speak to the people who went to Brussels for negotiations or in Washington, you know, they do all get along very well. Um, most of them still speak uh, the same language, Serbian. Uh, they make jokes with one another. The amount of of humor that I've heard from 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 the negotiating table is actually quite high. The amount of frustration and anger too is also quite high. But um, I think. And I think that also speaks to the fact that that what happens behind closed doors is very different from from what's generated for public consumption and then allowed to be um, exaggerated uh, quite possibly by by horrible media, especially in Serbia. Um, but um, I, I think maybe you know if if both sides do approach us in good faith, it's possible that uh, that there can be a new impetus. And I think you know, it should not be ignored as well that 
that it took it took more than a year and a half, I think, for this for the tariff against Serbian goods to be lifted. But but it was done eventually by Vivendosia, and I think in the end they were the only party that kind of had the public legitimacy to do that because it's precisely not necessarily there um, what they want to do. Now I, I guess I'm getting too much into the weeds, um, so I will maybe sit, come back to you for for another question or for for someone else to. No, make. I mean I, th I think I think this is this is good meaty material. Not weeds. It's, uh, but um, I want. I do want to kind of um, raise the aperture a little bit and ask Yvonne. We have, you know, this last year with all of this activity from the United States and from Brussels, which came to naught, and Valerie has um, made the the case, and Marco has made the case that in the region people understand the situation pretty well. At least the leadership does. The population maybe less so. Um, these new and the old um, government officials in Europe, in the United States, who get engaged time and again, what do they understand? And I think more interestingly, what do they not understand each time they kind of dive in? Is there, um, you know, is, is there a gap? Uh, are they making assumptions that are out of date or just uninformed? Uh, or do they understand and they're just using this politically, which is something that you and others have also already raised? Listen, it's, these days it's not clear who understands what anyway. So it's not only a Kosovo survey issue, but it, there were two different trends that were pushing behind the negotiations. One was very much driven by some of the local leaders who wanted to make a message that we're important enough and we can ready and negotiate between ourselves. And even if it is a divorce, we don't need the divorce lawyers. Uh, and this was very much about getting, uh, asserting the role of the national political leaders in a moment in which of course the Western Balkans are not at the top of the political agenda of anybody. For good reasons, you can see how many crises here and there. In the United States, of course, this administration is much more interested in the Western Balkans also for biographical reasons. Many of the people who are now in power, they have been in the Balkans, but this also could be a problem because they remember the Balkans from the time when they have been there. And the reason the region has changed a lot. Uh, and as a result of it, basically trying to see that the Western Balkans is not simply the post-conflict situation, that there is a very important demographic, economic changes. This is critically important. You should see what it is and not what it was. On the European side, of course, uh, also there was an issue because Europeans were highly frustrated with the fact that they believe that they're in the driving seat and they can deliver. And probably this is one of the few places you can deliver and nothing much was happening. So on paper, you have a lot of leverage over all the players. And at the end of the day, nothing is happening. So I'm afraid that on one level, you have much more nostalgic view and on the way, much more frustration. And this is bad to understand what is going on. There is a major generational change, for example, in places like Kosovo. A lot of young people, for them, this is a different place. There is a different place also uh, in Serbia. Also the relations between the external powers to the conflict has changed dramatically. This day, of course, United States and the European Union are going to be much more coordinated than during the last American administration, but it's different Turkey comparing with the 10 or 15 years ago. It's different Russia comparing with 10 or 15 years ago. So I do believe that the major risk is, and this is why I found the report quite important is, we start with the idea that, okay, they're not going to be a breakthrough, but also the assumption is that nothing really wrong can go and happen. Unfortunately, this was the assumptions behind the Armenian uh, Azeri Nagorni Karabakh story. So the fact that certain conflict is frozen does not mean that it cannot be warmed up. And it's not about climate change. Uh, so I do believe that the report is making a very important point. And the point is that, listen, this unresolved conflict is there and it can be used by different political forces, by different external and internal actors at some point to make a point. And this I found uh, uh, really, uh, really worrying. And from this point of view, looking at Nagorno-Karabakh and trying to see something that was sleeping 
for such a long time and how kind of a violently woke up should be something that uh, both Europeans, Americans, and for sure people in the region should keep uh, into account. And uh, this, is, this is why I do believe that probably this is what we are not understanding. We assume that nothing really positive and constructive can happen on a short term, but we also relax that nothing really bad can happen. And uh, while I agree with the report that we cannot expect the positive breakthrough in the next months, the things always can go wrong much easier than we expect. That's cheerful. Um, I, want, I want to build on that. I mean, I, I've also been thinking a lot about um, Karabakh. Uh, and one of the things that strikes me as a big difference uh, is that over the 30 years of failure to resolve um, the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, the societies have gotten further and further and further apart. There isn't that joking. There isn't that mutual understanding. There's just been a complete uh, separation of the two societies. Um, it's not quite the same uh, with Kosovo and Serbia, but there is, as, um, as all the pan panelists have alluded to, there is a popular belief that the rhetoric is more than just the rhetoric. These aren't just negotiating positions. These are things that are attainable. So I wanted to ask Marco what it takes to, in the words of um, South Caucasus leaders, right, before they started the war, they kept talking about the need to prepare the populations for peace, uh, which obviously did not happen. Uh, the populations instead continue to be prepared for war. How do you prepare these populations for peace? Well, you, you need to, that's a great question. Um, you need to uh, get them thinking about what the real choices are facing their society. Um, and, you know, in other, in other conflicts, I think people understand that. They understand the, the different options. I mean, you know, I'm not an expert on things like, you know, the Middle East, but I, I would like to think that if you go and you have discussions with, you know, reasonably well-educated uh, people um, in the Arab-Israeli conflict, they could explain the different policy options that are that are out there, one state, two state, you know, et cetera. Um, those things are all up in the air, even if they, even if a particular person, you know, dislikes one or another of them. That does not really happen in, in my experience outside of a very select company in, in Kosovo and, and, and Serbia. So you need to, um, you need to at least start doing what Serbia's President Vucic has been doing, um, which is alluding in this extremely vague way to, you know, the need to make compromises and we're not necessarily going to get everything. You know, that is like step one. They need to go many steps beyond that and start saying, okay, well, you know, we could, we could do this, we could do that, here's what we can get, here's what we can give up. Kosovo has not even, the Kosovo leaders have not even taken that step. Okay, there was a, during the dating to which you alluded. Um, they, uh, uh, Hashim Tachi, then, then President Tachi, what started, you know, tiptoeing toward that. Uh, he's, of course, now out of commission for other reasons, being uh, on trial for, for war crimes uh, in The Hague. Um, but you need to start explaining to people, you know, if we are to come to terms with our neighbor, here is here are the different kinds of relationships that are that are conceivable, and also, and this is a maybe maybe just as important as everything I've just said. Also, just be frank with them about the realistic possibility that we will continue living the way we're living now. You know, I don't want to say forever, but for the rest of you know your lifetimes, that's also a choice. You know, people sometimes think you know it's just going to get better. We don't like any of these options that are being offered. They're all kind of unpleasant. They make us nervous. You know, something better will come along if we just wait. Um, and Valerie mentioned the, the quote um, that uh, attributed to Alban Corti, that we just be patient. Being patient makes sense if you think time is on your side, but you know, if time is working against you, it's the wrong strategy. So you need to just be open with people about the possibility that in 2030, we'll be having this same conversation 
accept that some of the things that you now dislike, some of the options that you now dislike will no longer even be on the table and you'll be looking at even worse options. Okay, that is also possible. In fact, that is likely, uh, more likely than not. So this is the kind of discussion. And if you're listening to me and thinking, gee, I would hate to be a leader saying that, you know, I would indeed hate to be a leader saying that to my people too, which explains why they don't do it, but uh, they have to find a way. They have to find a way and they have spin doctors and high price consultants who can explain how to give that message in a slightly sweeter, easier to swallow version than, than I've just done. Valerie, from all of your years watching this, this part of the world, what do you think are the odds that they can sweeten this particular pill? Well, I mean, I think it's quite, I think that this year is kind of a missed opportunity. I think it would have been very interesting to see what could have happened, um, you know, in a pandemic year where, uh, where Vepindosia came to power for the first time, you know, warts and all focused on the pandemic, but maybe, maybe they wouldn't have been able to do as good of a job as they did the first few months. Maybe they wouldn't have been able to continue that all year. Um, but, but, uh, but it's, there is a parallel world where, where they might have built up a lot of trust. You know, you have a quite nationalist credentials of a, of a politician and you have um, some, a negotiating partner on the other side in President Vucic, who no longer has any excuse um, for why he can't make a deal. I mean, he has a super majority in his parliament. He, you know, you know, it could have been, we could have been in a scenario where time was running out for him because he, he really cannot say anymore to your, could not say anymore to European interlocutors, well, like they won't let me do this or well, I can't, or well, I wouldn't be able to deliver a majority in a constitutional referendum, you know, uh, which is required um, for Serbia to amend its constitution to remove mention of Kosovo in it. Um, and instead, of course, he can say, he can continue to say, well, I'm ready to make a deal. I'm here to negotiate. Um, but, but look, you know, it's very disorganized down there. I don't have anyone, you know, I don't have anyone with enough legitimacy to make a deal with. Um, that being said, there are definitely a lot of things uh, that could be happening, I think, in Serbia to this end that are not, which are, you know, improved coverage, um, not continuing to, to lie to people, uh, to the public, um, making some statements about the, the type of hate speech uh, against Albanians that appears so regularly in the media, um, and, and kind of pursuing at home the same kind of face that, that Vujic tries to show abroad, uh, which is, um, which is that, that we want to, to have good neighborly relations, you know? I mean, President Vucic has, has uh, won a lot of credit for, for trying to be a regional leader in creating this, a mini Schengen zone. Um, but when you look at the polls done, for instance, by students at the University of Belgrade, you know, I think 60% of Serbs that they polled wouldn't want to have an Albanian as a neighbor. Almost 90 wouldn't want their child to marry one. Uh, you wouldn't want them to be a teacher, etc. And I think that that the public discourse uh, that's modeled by by politicians um, uh, and by 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 those who have quite a lot of tremendous access to to mass media um, is is really important, and I think that that continues to sting and frustrate for many people uh, in Kosovo. Um, and I, I think you know what, there's certainly a lot of resentment in the in the Kosovo public sphere. There's also certainly a lot of strong rhetoric, um, you know, and continued use of the Vetvendosia slogan: "No negotiation, self determination." Um, but uh, I think that you know Marco very rightly pointed out in the report that that ver that very little is being done to prepare any anything anyone for a deal. And I think the public climate is worse now, for instance, in Serbia as far as um, hate speech is concerned uh, than it was 10 years ago. And that's very concerning. Thank you. Um, we are well on our way and I wanna make sure we get questions from the audience into this discussion. So I'm gonna start bringing those in. Um, 
The first one, and having asked you for your names and affiliations, please do forgive me if I in any way butcher the pronunciation. You are free to butcher the pronunciation of my name whenever um, it comes up in your own professional career. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, Jasmina Kosmanovic uh, from Bloomberg, who asks, I think, all of the panelists um, what their expectations are for Kosovo-Serbia dynamics with the Biden administration and for the US cooperation with Germany under Merkel while she's still in place. And I'd follow that up with after that. I mean, this has come up, but uh, I'd like to um, go into a little more detail. And I think I'll start with Yvonne for this one and then we'll kind of go around. Thank you very much. Uh, let's start with Germany, not because it is easier, uh, but first of all, we should try to see how the post-Merkel Germany looks like. Uh, there are going to be an elections and we don't know even how the government is going to look like. But there is one thing that is going to change. First, I do believe now Germany is facing pressure on so many fronts, starting with the European Union, relations with China, relations with the United States, that you believe that the serbia kosovo dialogue is going to be on the top of the German agenda is slightly unrealistic. And secondly, while for the Chancellor Merkel, it was quite important because over the years, she has developed the relationship with the leaders in the region. They trusted her, she trusted them to a certain extent. Um, for nevertheless, who is going to be the next German leader, he is not going, at least in the beginning, to have this relationship. So to a great extent, Germany's presence in the region, Germany's leverage was uh, Merkel's leverage. And they're going to be some time before, nevertheless, who is the next German leader is going to have this type of a trust relationship. Uh, and for me, this is important because to a great extent, anybody who wants to do something about the Western Balkans should try to make it a personal issue. Seeing so many different problems in the world, it's uh, it's not going to be, uh, to, be, uh, to be easy otherwise uh, to achieve anything. And the second thing is that I do believe here both for different reasons, Serbia and Kosovo and their leaders can read some changes in the international relations strongly. Uh, on the Kosovo side, uh, most of the Kosovo leaders basically assumed the support of the international community of the Western countries of the United States as something given not realizing how much you have this really shift based on the fact that when people discuss Western Balkans, their linkages to other issues too. Relations with Russia, relations with Turkey, general relations between US and the European Union. So this is not like it was in the beginning of the century. On the Serbian side, I do believe that what uh, uh, President Vucic does not realize is that if you're international actor, and you're looking at the Serbia-Kosovo dialogue, you see Vucic is so strong that he can deliver anything that he wants. And Kosovo looks in a certain way so contested and dysfunctional that there is no much need to press them on anything because basically you're not going to achieve much. So Kosovo is very much in a way benefiting from their weakness and Vucic is going to pay the price of looking basically so powerful because anything that he's not doing Basically, the international community says he is not doing because he does not want to do it. Uh, and in my view, this kind of asymmetry is also going to be particularly important because one of the interesting story about the Serbia-Kosovo dialogue that we didn't uh, we didn't talk about is that for both Kosovo leadership and for the Serb leadership, being part of this dialogue is the way to focus the attention on the problems of their countries. Because of the Kosovo-Serbian dialogue, Kosovo president or prime minister, Serbian president can call world leaders. In a normal situation, people without the problems that they have is not going to be so easy to reach neither the chancellor nor somebody on a high position on the American side. So they had the privilege over these years to have an access to a top international decision makers. And they're using this. I do believe this is one of the reasons why nobody is going to be interested to put an end to the dialogue. The moment when they're not negotiating to each other, they don't have much reasons, their calls to be taken seriously by the capitals uh, outside of the region. And this dynamics, at least in my view, is going to be quite, uh, quite important. Thank you, Ivan. Um, we actually have a lot of questions. So I think um, I'm going to 
kind of fire a question at a panelist. And then if other panelists want to integrate answers to other questions into their responses, they can do that as we go. Um, so the next question is um, from Deanna Sarich of CSIS um, and it's addressed to Valerie. And it's about the impact on um, the self-determination party, even if they win the upcoming election, if Kurti is not allowed on the ticket. Um, Valerie, what do you think? Well, um, and I, I never put in the caveat, of course, that these are only my views and I'm not, you know, uh, expressing any opinion of my employer. Um, uh, but my sense is from, from people that I talk to every day in Kosovo is that uh, frustration will grow uh, among people and I think it will only increase their support. I mean, uh, you know, on, when Vetman Dossier won, by a hair, the elections on October 6 in what was the 2019 in the pre pandemic era, you know, they had 30%, 30%, yeah, something like 30, 33%. They, they had one percentage point above LDK. Now they're cut polling between 50 and 60. And I think the frustration over the way that the government was toppled and, and what will be perceived frustration. Uh, considering that that Corti will not be allowed to, to, to run uh, will will help their support. Um, I, but it's also possible, it seems to be uncharted legal territory, whether or not Corti will still be allowed to be the prime minister. Uh, in Kosovo, you don't have to be an elected uh, member of parliament in order to be elected prime minister. So it's still, it, it's still possible that technically that he could become the prime minister, but I presume if that happened, it would then go to the constitutional court and we would again have another you know months and months of, of a waiting game um and of course the parliament needs to elect the <laughs> the president so that that could also be very complicated um but but they could elect the president even while the prime ministerial post is in the constitutional court but it's a, it's a real shame and a pity to again be in a situation of this kind of uncertainty because there's a global pandemic on. Kosovo is not doing that well. Um, they still haven't sorted out precisely how they're going to get vaccines. Um, and I think, you know, we haven't talked that much about the pandemic, but I think, you know, uh, cooperation on facilitating vaccinations and, and helping um, could have been a big gesture of goodwill. Um, you know, Serbia has been doing incredibly well in pro procuring vaccines, both from Pfizer, also from Sinopharm, also from Sputnik. And it, I mean, there are so many legal issues related to that, uh, that we're watching uh, play out these days. You know, they, the uh, Kosovo authorities raided a clinic uh, in a mixed but predominantly Serb um, town in the, in the south of Kosovo, Stutze, because they thought that the Chinese vaccine had been illegally imported. You know, what are the rights of citizens of people who hold Serbian citizenship who can technically access Serbian healthcare in the territory of Kosovo? And I think, you know, if there had been a lot of goodwill presented, this is something that that could have been something that that brought the parties together and, and created a big good step of goodwill. Um, and it's I think that's a real missed opportunity. Thank you, Valerie. Um, the next question is from Kurt Bessiner. Hi, Kurt. Um, and I'm going to condense it a little bit. He is um, asking about the, uh, the impact um, of possible ways forward on recognition for democratic development in both Serbia and Kosovo. Um, so start with Marco and uh, then if uh, Valerie and Vaughn want to weigh in, they can do that. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great question and um, an interesting situation. Uh, in Kosovo, despite being uh, the youngest country, uh, literally and metaphorically, in the, in the Western Balkans, um, and, and a country with all kinds of institutional problems with its democracy, nonetheless has a vibrant democracy. Okay, so voters have a choice. Um, and uh, governments, you know, parties win and lose power, right? And Valerie alluded, you know, the opinion polls are all are all suggesting that that there could be a big win for for Vetran Dosia. That would be a real novelty um, for uh, for Kosovo to have them um, in uh, in a stable government. So you you kind of got democratization. You know, at least you've got something to to work with uh, in in Kosovo. Serbia is in a very weird position now. It is hard to think of a time when it has been less 
uh, less democratic, I guess. I mean, there are still elections, but, and I'd like to point to one irony that is sometimes forgotten. Um, Vucic and, and his party came into power on a domestic platform, but they also came into power with fairly good relations with European leaders despite their nationalist um, coattails or baggage, because they were seen, because they promised to be more cooperative with respect to Kosovo, and they were more cooperative than the previous government. And we have seen how high the price tag for that is in the systematic dismantling of civil society, the free press, and democratic institutions in Serbia. So, and yet, you know, and there's always another side, and yet we do have the situation where now it is easier for Belgrade to make concessions than it would otherwise have been. It's easier for Belgrade than it is for, for Kosovo for the reason that if Vucic does something that is that some could read as you know nationally humiliating, he can weather that. Whereas uh, any government, any party that is part of a governing coalition in Kosovo knows that whatever it is they 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 um, they put forward, whatever concession they they put on the table in the dialogue, is liable to be you know twisted, uh, used out of context. They're going to be hammered with it on social media by their rivals. Um, even if those rivals supported that very same position up until yesterday. So it's just much harder in a, to do this kind of thing where you have a vibrant democracy. Um, that may not be a satisfactory answer. It's not a satisfactory situation. But at least that's the way I see it. Um, I wanna see if Yvonne or Valerie wanna jump in on this. Um, and if not, we'll go on to other questions of which we have a wealth. Either of you have anything to add? Okay. okay. Just one sentence, which is very, but this is quite important. If you see basically the argument on which uh, Vucic tried to justify his monopoly on power, more and more it's becoming the economic argument. We are delivering on the economy and even on the story of the COVID-19, if you see the percent of the population being vaccinated, Serbia is one of the leaders of the world. From this point of view, one of uh, the kind of temptations on the Kosovo side is to play the political competition because I very much agree in Kosovo, you have a vibrant political competition. The government can lose elections, <laughs> which is not becoming so easily in many of the Balkan countries these days. Some of the leaders don't know how to do it anymore. Uh, but uh, the problem is that at the same time, this should not be at the cost of going on symbolic politics and trying to marginalize the economic issues. Because at some point you need an political competitions that deliver into the people. Uh, democracy cannot simply be that you're changing governments. The government should give you something. And from this point of view, the discussion about the Serbia-Kosovo relations is very much about the relations between the symbolic and between the economic benefits. Kosovo can really benefit a lot if they're going to be a solution. And the, to be honest, Serbia can benefit a lot if they're going to be solution of this problem. So the more both society try to think in economic terms, in a way it's going to be easier to go for this compromise that uh, and mutual recognitions we're talking about. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Stephen Whitaker, um, who is wondering if um, the panelists could elaborate on the issue of so-called land swaps. And more specifically, which Valerie had also raised uh, in passing um, uh, a little bit earlier in our discussion, and um, specifically whether you buy into the idea that facilitating such a scenario could destabilize neighboring countries such as Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, I'm going to start with Marco again on this one because uh, it's, well, it's his report and I know he has views. So, Marco. Yeah. Uh, land swaps. Uh, I've actually changed my view on this uh, over over the years. Um, I used to think that it was a good idea, um, a positive thing, that, that it was something that just should be done. 
and the reason I thought that was because the areas where uh, that, that were in question, so northern coast of El Presio Valley, um, from what I knew from being there, I've actually never visited Presio, but I have very close friends who are from there and who spent a lot of time there. Um, they, to some extent, already live as though they had been swapped and overwhelmingly would prefer to be swapped. So I thought, you know, we should just do what the people want. And my view now is that that is still true, but it is risky. There are real, there are a lot of risks. Um, so what I've come down to is exactly what it says in the report. This is an option that is far from ideal. And I would not go any further than saying, if whoever's in charge in Belgrade and whoever's in charge in Pristina think that they can make it work, and I, I absolutely agree with uh, Ivan's uh, caveat that this has to be, this has to go beyond the leadership. You know, Serbia, it's already clear that it's got to be handled in a referendum. You know, Kosovo leaders may want to have a referendum too, uh, for whatever it is they they finally agree on. Um, it's got to have, you know, deep support, wide and deep support. Um, and we just shouldn't, I think it's a distraction, this whole debate of, can it be on the agenda or, or not, I think is a distraction. When you have parties who are so far apart from uh, each other, as Belgrade and Pristina are, telling them that they need to be even further apart by not being able to discuss certain things that they might want to discuss and actually have discussed in the past, I think is, is a mistake. That's about as far as I'm willing to go. As far as whether it can destabilize countries, I don't really see that happening in Bosnia for reasons that would take us, I think, too long um, to go into. But, you know, Bosnia has been destabilized for a long time, okay? The, you have a secessionist party in power in Republika Srpska. They have made absolutely no secret of their you know, not only their desire, but even their plan eventually to secede. So this is not a new thing. And it, it is not connected uh, to, to Kosovo in, the, in their mind or in anyone else's mind. Um, the place I'm more concerned about really is North Macedonia. Um, but I think that can be handled. And it, you know, if the one thing I would say to, to uh, leaders of Serbia and Kosovo is, you, you should also, this is also to some extent on you. Um, it will be, if you, if you do choose to go that route, you need to take steps to talk to your, um, um, whoever you're close to in the neighboring countries uh, and ensure that you do this without harming them. Thanks, uh, Marco. Valerie, you've had, uh, okay, Yvonne wants to jump in, but Val I think Valerie does also. So um, Valerie first and then Yvonne. Thanks. Well, I'll try and be brief. I, Mar Marco covered a lot of the points. I, I think one of the fr the first thing is, of course, that there was so much talk about land swap, but nobody knew precisely what it would entail. Nobody ever saw it. I mean, there were, of course, there's discussion and a hush hush among the think tank world about precisely what's on the table and how much territory and what are the places. But, but you know, the public was never given some real idea of what could be, you know. I mean, Kosovo, all of the countries have had to demarcate their borders. Um, and I think, you know, a couple of kilometers here and there with access to, to resources or shared access to resources, um, you know, makes a big difference in terms of whether or not, whether people would support it or not. I will say that, you know, the border demarcation with Montenegro took two years and, and several, at least one government fell because of that, uh, which, you know, you would imagine that, um, I don't know, was it 2000 hectares of land, a very mountainous rocky land, um, which I would argue probably has a lot less meaning for, for, for many Kosovo Albanians and Serbs than, uh, than, than a swap of territory. Um, uh, the other thing and the other main reason why at that time, I think there was very, there was no legitimacy uh, or very little legitimacy for that idea in Kosovo was because it was being seen as um, something that, that, that the president thought she was willing to agree to in order to um, to save himself from from indictment with an indictment which now has come um and and that a trump administration was doing it for their own short-term um 
goals in a way that wasn't really thought out, which, you know, and we saw the, I think we've all seen the way that that president or ex-president Trump tried to, um, to sell the, 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 the White House deal that he ended up getting. Um, in terms of destabilizing other countries, I mean, I agree with you, Marco, that, that North Macedonia would be a big threat and, and you know, uh, North Macedonia's president, Stevo Pendarovsky, even after the country joined NATO, was very, very vocal about his fear for, for the effects that, that a land swap would have um, on North Macedonia. And I think there are many people in Bosnia as well. And I, I think, I mean, I, and I also think that uh, many, many people were worried about the message that it sends in the 21st century that, that, that people can't live together. Because as we said earlier uh, in this call, m many people find ways of getting along together in North Mitrovica, they go to this, the, often go to the same stores. You know, there's one big mega mall where though things are cheaper. People go there, people have contact, they still have contact with their old neighbors and stuff. And so it sends a pretty dispiriting message in the 21st century um, that the only way to have peace is, is to, to segregate people. Um, but that being said, um, I think it's very hard to just dis to 100% dismiss the concept without, you know, knowing more concretely what, what would be on the table. And I do, uh, Marco very astutely makes the point that, that both sides need to feel that they've, they've gotten something. So, uh, which I can understand why many, most Kosovars find that insulting and, and frustrating, but, um, I guess it's still a fact. Ivan, go ahead, <laughs> take it away. I, I, I do believe Marco made one very important distinction because the question about the land swap became the problem of the role of the international community. I don't see the role of the international community imposing land swaps to anybody. On the other side, I don't see the role of the international community telling the Serbs and the Kosovars, you cannot do this, you cannot do this, because then you are basically owning this. I'm very kind of, uh, I don't see this as a realistic solution, particularly in this moment. I never believed this this way. I have never been very much interested uh, in what exactly it means. But this is very important to tell to the negotiators on both sides. Listen, guys, you have all the options you can agree on, which is legal. We are not going to stop you because of Bosnia for one very simple reason. The lack of a land swap is not going to stabilize Bosnia. I don't know, is it going to destabilize it? But obviously the problem of Bosnia, very much in Bosnia, then is what is happening in the region. And the international community should try to make basically the politicians responsible for what they decide. Because all the time is what kind of a message is coming from the international Come with both say, oh, I'm not doing this because you are not allowing me to do this, or I'm not doing this because you are not allowing me to do this. Okay, Ivan, and you... this is the status quo, which I don't believe in the internet community. Okay, we're, we're kind of, we've got a bit of a in and out on Yvonne, but I, I think I think we got the gist and I know Marco wants to jump in. Um, so I'm gonna let him do that. We're running out of time. So I'm gonna let Marco respond quickly. Then we'll do one more question and I am gonna have to close this up. Just wanted to add one thing um, on that exact topic of uh, the risks. Um, it's worth remembering that or, or note, noting that um, the status quo also has risks for the neighboring states. Um, there was, okay, we're now in an election campaign in Kosovo, so this we should probably take statements like this with a grain of salt, but one of the, the leaders um, has called for a, a referendum on um, unification with, uh, with Albania. That would, in my view, and I think in the view of a lot of people, uh, be even more destabilizing for, for Macedonia if it were to happen. Totally unrealistic, but um, it, it's not, you always have to look at the costs, not only of, a, of an action, but also of refraining to take that action because it's not cost-free. Thank you. Um, last question, uh, which I think is a really good one uh, from uh, Jimu Shasha, who's the executive director of the European Policy Institute of Kosovo. 
uh, who points out that since the dialogue began in 2011, despite the lack of a big breakthrough, there have been positive steps, freedom of movement, liaison offices, Kosovo's energy independence, the two countries meet in regional fora. So what the question is that if we assume no realistic uh, scenario of recognition by Serbia of Kosovo independence by let's say 2025, what would be the plan B success? And um, let Marco respond first and then let uh, Ivan and Valerie jump in on kind of, you know, what, what's, the, uh, what's the plan B success? What does it look like? Um, and then I think we are gonna have to close up. So Marco, you first. Sure. Um, I don't see, uh, and I think it's actually an interesting question to which I don't have a complete answer. Okay, I'll give you my answer, uh, which is uh, that I, there's not a lot of room left to make progress without uh, without a comprehensive agreement with Serbia, but there is some room, um, so we should we should do that. And basically, I think it's on the the international legal side. So Kosovo can apply for and should be able to get into the Council of Europe, and that would extend the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights, which is you know important an important part of your Euro European law. Now, um, I think it would also be interesting. Uh, Kosovo has decided not to do this in the past. But it would be interesting to seek uh, non-member observer status in the General Assembly of, of the UN, because that carries. It's kind of like a, a I am a state card. You know, you're a non-member state, and therefore, with that affirmation, you can do things like bring cases, uh, at least under some circumstances, in the International Court of Justice. Um, you can potentially accede to the International Criminal Court. So these are things that would that would be to at least some extent stabilizing. And beyond that, I think it's just important to work on national consolidation, okay? Consolidating the educational system, building the economy, uh, building up healthcare, uh, improving governance. These kinds of things are likely to be high on the agenda of, uh, of Edwin Dossier government. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the long term, so past 2025, best case scenario there is shooting for a status something like Taiwan, where, yeah, sure, you know, you're not, you're excluded from the UN and all kinds of other international forums, but everyone admits that you're real and you're rich and you know, um, you're, uh, you're, you're a factor to be, to be a force to be reckoned with. It would take Kosovo you know, quite a while. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done uh, to, get, to get up to that, to that level if, 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 it is, if it is even possible. Um, but I, I, would, I would work on that, that kind of thing, work on the domestic side. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, just one thing, I believe probably both sides are going to like China-Taiwan comparison better than West Germany is Germany on the level of normalization. <laughs> so probably this is the plan B. Thank you, Valerie. I think I think Marco said a lot of it, but I think you know. It, if there's a really public campaign to, I mean, maybe this is a, a pure idealism, but a public campaign in both countries to to actively improve uh, the lives of minorities in in both of the in both of the countries. I mean, I think you know something that I saw for, from from my uh, reporting on on the the extent to which the um, agreements had been implemented. You know, what frustrated people most was like. The, the difficulties posed to their going about their daily lives, people who didn't have a Kosovo driver's license and couldn't, uh, you know, couldn't legally drive, you know, 10 kilometers away from down south from their house. Um, we have, there's still problems, I think, in, in adapting, um, you know, a driver's license. If you learn to drive in, Kos in North Kosovo, since it was declared independent, you cannot, that's considered still an illegal institution and you can't just transfer it to the Kosovo institution. But what we've seen is, especially when it concerns business, finance, tra um, trade um, and customs, you know, it's possible when there's really an interest to, for, for both sides to find a way to work around this. So, you know, prioritizing the needs of citizens to, to live a normal life, to have their diplomas recognized, uh, which was something that was agreed in 2011 and is still not implemented. And on a bigger scale, I think uh, we lost a lot of momentum in the relationships in the last few years with over the very active uh, de-recognition campaign by Serbia. 
I think even, you know, one thing that wasn't mentioned in the report, but maybe it wasn't, I don't know if it was ever proven, but, you know, even there was a, there was a media reports about payments to, to certain countries in Africa for, for de-recognizing. Um, and I think that sends the wrong message. I don't, I think that, that, that it's not equal to pursue recognition and pursue it on one side and to pursue de-recognition on another side, because I think that at a certain point, um, until let's say 2015, I, there, there was a realization in Belgrade that Kosovo was lost and okay, slowly we'll sort of quietly let them continue to, to make progress on the international stage without, um, without publicly uh, condemning that and, or with condemning it, but you know, allowing it as long as they don't acknowledge independence. And I think that is now something that really changed. Um, but I think that also Ivan's point really about, about the economies and improving, improving economic growth, um, I think is something that after this pandemic year um, is going to be more important than ever. And, and a time in which probably a lot of populations as well are returning home from Western Europe, there will be maybe more jobless people, uh, more people who are, are frustrated, who've been stuck in the country, who can't travel. Um, and I will make again a final plea for, for a more constructive uh, approach to vaccines. I mean, if Ser you know, Serbia is fifth in the world, maybe it would be interesting to see a way, you know, forcing, it would be very interesting, you know, because maybe they've done it and the Kosovo, no, you know, didn't want to accept it, but they can't tell that to their people. But but it puts it, it would it would create a very interesting dynamic, I think. So, thank you. Thank you all. Um, really terrific conversation, and uh, really appreciate all three of our panel panelists, um, Marco, Valerie, and Yvonne, for taking part and making this dynamic. Thank you so much for ev to everybody. We did not get to all of the many excellent questions, um, just demonstrating how much more there is to say. Um, this has been a public event. Uh, so all fully on the record, the recording is going to be available on the events page of the Crisis Group website, www.crisisgroup.org slash event dash recordings, uh, as well as our YouTube channel um, shortly after we, um, we turn this off. Um, but uh, again, just thank you so much for taking part. And again, this has been the launch of um, our report, how to relaunch the Kosovo Serbia dialogue. If you have not read it, uh, I encourage you to do so. We're quite pleased with how it's turned out. Thank you so much and goodbye.